and he wanted to find out if he cooled off summer temperatures by increments of 2 degrees centigrade, that's 3 degrees Fahrenheit, in his computer model, he wanted to find out where one inch of snow remained at, in, in mid or late September. You know, that's the end of the melting season. So that, that would be the start of a glaciation that would supposedly continue the next year. Well, when he cooled it off by, uh, down to 12 degrees centigrade, that's below uh, the summer temperatures, that's his one inch line from there northward. That's all the further he got the one inch line in northeast Canada. That's 20 degrees Fahrenheit cooling. But the ice was way south of the Great Lakes. So we need much more cooler, cooling in summer than in Canada there. How much? Well, Minneapolis has an average uh, summer temperature of 70 degrees Fahrenheit. This includes the minimum and the maximum. So we have to cool off the temperature down to at least 32 degrees Fahrenheit. But because sunshine is the major factor that melts snow and ice, and they have a lot of it in Minnesota as well as Canada during the summer, you've got to go well below freezing uh, to, to, to keep the snow there. So in, I went to Antarctica and found out that net melting begins on the edge of the Antarctic ice sheet near sea level when the temperature warms up to 14 degrees Fahrenheit. Then you have net melting. So you'd have to drop the temperature probably in Minneapolis to about 14 degrees Fahrenheit for the summer. But let's be more conservative. Let's just say we have to drop it only to 20 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, that means it's got to cool 50 degrees Fahrenheit to start an ice age in Minneapolis. Where are we going to get that from present processes? Remember, the uniformitarian evolutionary scientists rely on present processes to explain all the past, the rocks, the fossils, and also the past climate. What kind of present processes of climate change are going to cause this? Well, far from being a showcase for their model, the Ice Age is a huge problem. For instance, J.K. Charlesworth in this book, The Quaternary Era, by the way, the word quaternary is a, is a period of time that they mean Ice Age. Also, the Pleistocene is another term that means Ice Age. He said in 1957 on page 1,532, yes, that was a two-volume book of 1,600 pages. It's a great book, by the way. Pleistocene phenomenon have produced an absolute riot of theories. Are these theories all that good? No, they range from the remotely possible to the mutually contradictory and the palpably inadequate. <laughs> That's not saying much. And at that time, there was about 60 theories on the cause of the Ice Age. In fact, there's as many theories on the cause of the Ice Age as there is theories for the extinction of the dinosaurs. It's about 100 right now. And uh, that was in 1957. We know more now, right? We're in modern times. We know so much more. <laughs> well, let's take a look at some more quotes. U.S. News and World Report in 1997, August issue, one of the August issues, reported on 18 great mysteries of science. I imagine these are the top mysteries. But notice one thing, of these 18 mysteries, some of them are mysteries in, of their own making because they believe in evolution. Like that first one there, why should males exist? <laughs> what, what, what's, what's that all about? Why is that a mystery? Well, you know, in evolution, they can't figure out whether there's a male and female. It should all be asexual reproduction. That's where we, as Bible believers, have it hands down on their model because it says in Genesis, in the beginning he made the male and female. That's why we have male and female. <laughs> and they can't figure it out because they believe in evolution. And there's books and articles written every year about this topic trying to figure out this. It's a no-brainer for us, but some of these mysteries are, are real mysteries. And one of them is what causes ice ages. I can get more quotes. I can get dozens of them. David Alt, in the book Glacial Lake Missoula and its Humongous Flood, said, although theories abound, no one really knows what causes ice ages. Just recently, in Nature, 2008, perhaps the longest standing puzzle in the Earth's sciences is what caused the northern hemisphere ice sheets to come and go. So this is not any minor mystery, tiny little mystery. This is a major mystery of Earth science. It's been around for several hundred years. <coughs> I might add, and, and I'm just going to quickly go through that, besides the mystery of the cause of the Ice Age, there's many subsidiary mysteries associated with the Ice Age. That's why it's kept me busy for 35 years. 
And now one of them, these are uh, five of them right here, wet deserts, woolly mammoths, disharmonious associations. I'm going to define all these. End ice age extinctions, lowlands of Siberia, Alaska, and Yukon were unglaciated. What's this wet desert idea? Well, it, they find out that during the ice age that dry areas that are now deserty, like the Great Basin and, and Death Valley, had lakes in them during the ice age. In fact, in our own, and this was all over the world, by the way, the Dead Sea area, uh, the Sahara Desert. The Sahara Desert had huge rivers and lakes, and they find fossils of hippopotamuses out there. Ex you know, so, and here in our southwest, we had something like 30 lakes in so uh, southeast Oregon. This is the largest. It's called Lake Bonneville. It's about eight times the size of Great Salt Lake, and it was 800 feet deep. Well, Great Salt Lake right now is an average of 12 feet deep. So we had a huge amount of water in that area. And you see the shorelines from this lake easily. If you fly into Salt Lake, just look to the east. You'll see the shorelines, uh, about three of them, uh, really easy. In fact, this lake built up during the Ice Age so much that it, it overflowed in uh, southeast Idaho and caused the Bonneville flood in the Snake River Valley that came out like that through Hills Canyon and uh, into Washington State because it, it, it cr continued to increase because it was really wet during the Ice Age. And the Sierra, we have thousands of pictographs of, of people in the Sierras. Uh, from, you know, and a quote from a book of the Great Sierra says, the Sierra is a veritable art gallery of prehistoric paintings. The evidence is enough to show that the Sahara was one of the well-populated areas of the prehistoric world. Yet there, there is his work in the most inaccessible corners of the desert. Literally thousands of figures of tropical and aquatic animals, enormous herds of cattle, hunters armed with bows and boomerangs, and even domestic scenes of women and children in the circular huts in which they lived. They, it was a well-watered area. And the woolly mammoth. This is a woolly mammoth. The, the tusks curved in. It had hair up to uh, three feet long. They had three layers of hair. The outer layer was three feet long. It had a hump on its uh, neck, uh, its head, on its back, and its its back sloped down more than, than elephants today. It had small ears. You know, that's an, these are adaptations for uh, cold. So that's the woolly mammoth. And there's millions of them in Siberia, Alaska, and the Yukon Territory that were never glaciated. And by the way, they live down in the, in the United States too, as well as the Columbian mammoth, which is like this, but with less hair and a lot taller. I think this, this is about, oh, 10, 11 feet at the shoulders, while the Columbian mammoth was 13 feet at the shoulders. The Columbian mammoth was the largest elephant of, of that, that, that's ever existed. And mammoth extinction, of course, has been a mystery for <laughs> 200 years, too. Why did mammoths disappear from the earth? This is from uh, the, the top investigator of woolly mammoths, Larry Agenbrod, and, the, and, the, and uh, Lisa Nelson in the book Mammoths. Why did mammoths disappear from earth? This question remains one of the great unsolved mysteries of the past. Then that third subsidiary mystery associated with ice age is what's called disharmonious association. This is associations of animals that love the warmth with those that love the cold that were, that were mixed together and they're, they're found as bones in ice age deposits. And it's, it's not an exception, it's the rule. Late Pleistocene communities were characterized by the coexistence of species that today are allopatric, translated, not climatically associated and presumably were ecologically incompatible. Disharmonious associations have been documented for late Pleistocene, that's Ice Age floras, that's the plants, terrestrial invertebrates, lower invertebrates, birds and mammals. It was the rule. And this implies uh, equitable climate, where, where summers are cooler and winters are warmer, by the way. And the most outrageous example of disharmonious associations is in England, where you have 100 locations of hippos found with cold climate animals in 100 locations. Don Grayson of the University of Washington said in, in the book Quaternary Extinctions of Prehistoric Revolution, in the Valley of the Thames, that's the, in southern England, that goes, the river that goes through London, for instance, woolly mammoth, woolly rhinoceros, musk ox, reindeer, hippopotamus, and cave lion had all been found by 1855 in stratigraphic context that seemed to indicate contemporaneity. In other words, they lived together and it, during the Ice Age, a <laughs> big mystery. <laughs> and um, I haven't got time to go into these. I'm just giving you just a, sh uh, a preview. You can learn more about these in, in the book. 
Anyway, at the end of the Ice Age, when things are supposedly getting better, warming up, more the ice retreating, more land, suddenly many animals go extinct, where they never went extinct in all those other previous uh, glacials. It was only after the so-called last one, which indicates maybe there wasn't other glaciations. It's a big hint that there weren't any. But anyway, 100 uh, species of large animals in North America, uh, about 70% of large animals over 100 pounds went extinct. In Europe and Asia, it's 75%. Australia, it was even greater, 90%. But Africa, near zero. So that was the only exception right there in Africa. So huge end ice age mass extinctions. And these are all a mystery too. Uh, here's a, there was a book about 1999 discussing this. After many decades of debate, the North American end Pleistocene, that's end ice age, megafaunal mass extinctions remains a lightning rod of controversy. The extraordinary diversion opinions expressed in this volume shows that no resolution is in sight. It's been a mystery for 200 years. Some say the climate did it. Some say man did it. In, in 100 years in what's called a blitzkrieg of killing animals. <laughs> You read about and something uh, in between, and there's a third hypothesis that when man spread through uh, into Australia and uh, North America, he brought all these diseases and rats with him, and those what killed the animals. So there's all kinds of ideas. There's no resolution in sight. And as far as the the only the mountains of Alaska and Siberia and the Yukon Territory, which is right here. Uh, being glaciated, that's a major mystery because when they run their models of climate change, by the way, when they run their models, it's very hard to get an ice age. You've got to tweak it a lot to, to get it to, to glaciate. But when they do, <laughs> it ends up in the wrong spot. Here's, here's from the Journal of Climate. These uh, researchers in their models said, um, said, we now have glaciation, oh, but mainly outside the area where it existed during the last ice age. Oh, no. So it's a big mystery why the lowlands weren't glaciated. It's because they have the wrong model. Okay, they have problems, lots of them. Remember I said when you investigate these challenges, the first thing you find is that they have challenges themselves. It's the same way with all these hundreds of earth science challenges. And by the way, there's challenges in biology, but since I'm an earth scientist, I just focus in on the earth science ones. I think we have more of them in the earth science. And they're harder to investigate because you've got to go out and look at rocks and, and you've got to spend a lot of time uh, doing this. Why in biology, just run an experiment in the lab, I think uh, it's easier to, to uh, answer biological challenges. So can the biblical worldview explain the Ice Age? Can we explain it? Well, let's find out where it does it fit in our, in our model. Well, it's obviously after the flood. It's on flood rocks, sedimentary rocks. It's, they're loose sediments. They have nice horseshoe moraines that would not form in a, in a flood when the flood retreated. So it's obviously it occurred right after in a transitional climate to the present climate. So that brings up the possibility maybe the Genesis flood perturbed the climate enough to cause the ice age. Indeed, that is the case. What in particular did the Genesis flood do to cause this ice age? First of all, the flood was a huge tectonic event of uh, crust moving up and down and a lot of volcanism, lots of volcanism. You have lots of it in New Mexico, by the way, and a lot of that is from the flood, some of it's post-flood. So after the flood, you'd have a lot of volcanic dust and aerosols uh, in the stratosphere that cause summer cooling. We know they cause summer cooling. Uh, one of the talks uh, uh, emphasized that, for, uh, 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 yeah, your talk, uh, Krakatoa. Uh, uh, cooled the climate, and Tambora uh, in 1815. And we know that uh, these will do this. They've got to reach the stratosphere. They've got to be a fairly big eruption. Mount St. Helens was too small, by the way. And that one in Iceland was way too small. It didn't even go up into the stratosphere. Uh, from the news report, I haven't paid a lot of attention to that, and I've been too busy to really go get into it. I think it only went up to 25,000 feet, which is just below the stratosphere. You've got to get it into the stratosphere. <laughs> 